Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Call Me Cordelia, the podcast where we talk about everything under the sun regarding N with an E. I'm Ophelia. And I'm Alexis. And this is the season three wrap up where, where we will talk about everything about season three in a much broader picture. So what we thought of the season overall, some oddities, uh, honorable mentions of characters, uh, details, trivia, whatever. Yeah, big pod, big pod, this one. So, what, okay, Alexis, <laughs> <laughs> How? where do you rank season three as opposed to season one and two? Like all three of them or just season three in particular? All three of them. Oh gosh, okay, well, first place like season three was far and away in my opinion the best season yeah this season just really stuck out to me so top tier season three and then I'm gonna have to say season one and then season two not to say I didn't like season two but season three really just blew me away and I think that a lot of the attachment that I feel with season one is probably from a lot of nostalgia and just the, the introduction to the characters as a whole and everything. But yeah, no, this this was definitely the standout season, hands down. Yeah, no competition. What about you? I agree. For me, it's also season three, then two, then one. Uh, season three, one, and then two. God, season two will never be <laughs> the second no. place. Again, not to say season two was bad, but... 2A, so the first five episodes were not as great, in my opinion, because of the whole no. Thieves storyline and because of, you know, very sporadic little bits and pieces floating around. Yeah, I, I think that, and I might have mentioned this before, but I think that just the really standout thing about season three to me, like as opposed to the other seasons, is season one was very introductory. You know, the first few episodes are extremely expositional. Which is to be expected in a TV series. But I think season three stuck out to me so much. Not only because we were already so attached to the characters and everything. But this show is so slice of life-y, I guess. And the way that it's set up and everything. That when you have all these different subplots going on. You know, all these different things that are going on in Anne's life. Like... Kakwet and the newspaper and like Sherbert, all of these subplots are, are being used to make up the overarching story. And in season two, kind of like what you briefly mentioned with the thieves, I found that I wasn't interested in all of the subplots going on. Very much more invested in certain things that were happening as opposed to, like you said, I think the thieves are kind of the standout thing to me that I really didn't care about them at all. And it was Anytime that their plot was kind of first and foremost, it was very much like, okay, like, when are we going to change scenes? As opposed to season three, they had all of these subplots going on, and I really found myself caring about every single one of them, like, deeply. They were very, very well handled. Diana, uh, Kakwet, you know, the dealing with grief with Mary and Sherbert and Bash with his mother, like, I... I cared about every single one of them, which is very hard to do in television in general. But in a format like this slice of life, I think that's even more difficult. But they just did it beautifully this season. And I think that's why it's probably, like, definitely my favorite. Yes, it's season three managed to have all these complex storylines, but handle them in solid ways where we can really see which episode is about what and how it uh, fades out into the next, uh, fades in into the next. And they just handle it all so well and used their time correctly for each storyline. We'll get into the unfinished storylines later, but the ones that are finished were well done. So in... In some way, they were able to talk about cultural genocide, freedom of speech, sexual assault, uh, heritage, all in 10 episodes in such a tasteful way. 
And then to top it all off, they added a lot of romance, especially for Anne and Gilbert. It's it was it was just such a solid season, and nothing will top it. Yeah, no, I don't think so. I think it's like what you were saying. Just the plots that were finished, and again, we're going to talk about the ones that were kind of left a little bit open ended later on. But the ones that were finished, nothing felt half baked, or nothing felt like. It wasn't done justice, I guess. Like, with, like I said, Diana and her character development is one that kind of sticks out in my mind, which we'll get to. But everything just felt really fleshed out and everything was done justice. Uh, nothing was just kind of dropped. Like, I think, again, we're just going to keep going back to this as an example, but season two, like, the themes just kind of felt like it was just sort of dropped and the prissy and uh mr phillips thing you know was something that i really did not care to see or talk about at all but it was just part of what was going on but yeah wow this season we just kept you know you look back at the pods in each episode we just keep saying like yeah i think this is my new favorite episode or like wow this episode (laughs) like past last week because they just kept getting better and better um and i think also the characters were just hitting that sweet spot with their age where they still had a lot of things to to learn and to grow in and develop with, but they'd already had so much development from where we saw them in season one. So it was fun to watch them this time, especially Anne, I think. I agree. I think that's also why so many shows are about teenagers because Adolescence is such an interesting topic to discuss in a form of media Mm -hmm. and like putting it into a historical drama about progressive teenagers in Canada is, you know, it's, it's really cool. What was your favorite plot line of season three? And if you can't decide, then you can choose between 3A and 3B. (laughs) <laughs> Ooh, um, I feel like it's gonna be a really cheap answer if I say Sherbert because I mean that's like obvious but if we're not going with Sherbert then I loved just every single scene with the kids at school I've said it once I've said it a million <laughs> times but I love the schoolhouse scenes and the dynamics so honestly the whole newspaper freedom of speech plot line was really really good and very very interesting yeah and even though it was so short we talked about it in the episodes that it took place in but just the whole depiction of grief and not that I enjoyed Mary dying at all like oh that it was awful but the depiction of grief and just watching each of the characters individually dealing with it was so interesting to me um in the sense that uh, you know as someone who has dealt with grief before it was very accurately done and I loved the way that they worked through it and depicted it for the episodes that it was happening in but yeah I think overall besides Sherbert uh the freedom of speech newspaper preparing for queens sort of plot line all wrapped up in one was was my favorite for sure for me it was 3a was definitely Mary's storyline Uh, and her untimely demise and then for 3b it was the freedom of speech because i loved how josie had a central part in it since she is one of my favorite side characters in my opinion the girls like tilly and jane they have their own character but they don't have many interesting feats about them in my opinion whereas Mm -hmm. josie is more layered and I I loved how she developed so much and had the opportunity to show emotion so now I'm talking about the actress but I really loved that scene and I feel like in it I've said it again in the podcast about the freedom of speech thing in a time where everything is so polarized and radical ideas are being thrown left and right it is very important to have a show 
where this is discussed in a very tasteful way and in a right way. Yeah. So it was very good to have them handle that topic. Yeah, it was. And also, like, the the fact that she did it in a period drama where now it's polarizing, but then, like, the freedom of speech and, and expression and having different opinions was even more kind of unheard of with censorship being something that could be imposed a lot more heavily I think but you did briefly mention Josie and she is one of my standout characters for this season um, Same. and she, yeah and she snuck up on me like I really <laughs> was not at all expecting to have a whole section on why I loved Josie Pye's character this season um and I don't think I really realized how much she did sneak up on me until, obviously, the episode after the whole um, sexual assault with Billy, which was awful and horrible. And the way that it was depicted was just heartbreaking. But the way that I didn't realize how much she had developed until Anne went to go apologize and she started calling her trash again. And that was so shocking to me. And then once I was shocked, I was like, wait oh my gosh like that's really what would be considered out of character for Josie at this point it was just complete character regression like in an instant and I didn't realize how far from that she was until she fell back to that point and it it wasn't this huge dramatic thing where the girls all like sat down and told Josie you know stop being mean like this is mean and you're uh, being a bad person it just kind of happened to obviously at some point over the time jump, like she had just started growing out of her mean girl phase and um, falling more into the idea of accepting that Anne's part of the group and these are her friends now and she doesn't have to exert control over them and, and being a bully, I guess. But I think out of all of the characters also, it was an interesting choice to explore a sexual assault plotline with Josie in particular and I guess we talked about this also but they had sort of started setting it up last season with yeah. Josie's mother and how much she valued beauty and Josie being married off and all of that so I think it was it was a very interesting choice I don't I don't you know have an opinion on it one way or the other but I just thought it, it was an interesting decision but yeah, her, her character really stuck out to me this season, and I was not at all expecting that at all. Now that we're talking about her, uh, just to di deep dive into her character, I loved how Josie and Prissy are kind of a mirror of one another because they were in the mm -hmm. same boat of only being valued by their beauty and not so much by their intelligence, whilst both of them are very witty and very cunning. Like, I can see both of them being politicians. <laughs> and I love how they, you know, Anne with an E is obviously about Anne, but I love how they, separately from Anne, found their independence in their own ways. Percy by going to college and not going along with their parents, with her parents' ways. Mm -hmm. And Josie by also stepping up to you know rebelling against her parents but this time about love and I think it's just that was also really important for me that despite the show being about Anne it's not always about Anne and I know we have right. the storyline about Bash and stuff that is not at all related to Anne at all but when it's about school it's usually her being the focal point so it's nice to see that there was development outside of her character. Okay, I'm giving you an ultimatum. Was Mary dying more heartbreaking or coquette at the end of season three? Oof. Situationally, coquette. But I think in terms of what we saw in the show, Mary, for sure. I definitely cried harder with Mary. But I think it was only because we saw that storyline sort of all the way through. And it was something we very much didn't see coming. I think that took us way more by surprise than Kakwet did. 
but I had time to prepare because of we, we talked about even before the show started, you know, you said we talked about the First Nations people and what they were most likely going to do. Really, as soon as they started talking about the school, we knew it was going to be horrible, horrible to watch. And we kind of had time to prepare for it. But Mary just, it just kind of happened. And I was not at all bracing myself for Mary, of all people, to die this season. So it was, yeah, it, it was way more heartbreaking to me, I think, because it took me so much by surprise. And also because we kind of got more resolution with Mary. Whereas Kakwet was one of the storylines, you know, like we said, that they kind of left open-ended. And I think we had also spent more time with Mary. But historically and situationally, I would say that I think Kakwet and, and what was happening with the First Nations children is more heartbreaking. But in terms of what we saw in the show, Mary got to me way more. What about you? I agree. I was tied, so that's why I asked you. But I agree now, um, Mary was emotionally harder because we really knew her and we saw it all happening slowly, kind of like a wilting flower, very sad. (laughs) Whereas, you know, from the second it was announced there would be an indigenous girl in the cast, I knew, like, oh shit, this is okay. Yes, this is happening. Uh, the residential schools, yeah. yeah. So Mary was emotionally heartbreaking. Kukwet was heartbreaking in the fact that we know what's going to happen. Kind of like a horror movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We've talked about Josie and her stellar performance this season. Uh, who else do you think did a stellar job? Well, this should come as a shock to nobody if you've been listening throughout the season, but honestly, Diana and Delilah, I guess is acting Diana, but Diana's character just, like, stole the season for me. She really came out of her shell. She had this great development. I've always loved Diana, but I think that her development has always very much been way more subtle and yeah way more secondary I guess to her just being Anne's friend if that makes sense like she was very much more portrayed as Anne's friend these past best friend these past two seasons but this one was very much more about Diana and we've had little moments I think in the past with her that we've seen her starting to to develop out of this kind of shy obedient passive almost person you know in season one where we saw her talking to ruby and saying like you know it doesn't matter what the other girls think ruby it matters what you think which was definitely development from what we'd seen in diana in the past but this season she just really came into her own i think delilah was given way more range to work with and it was heartbreaking for sure. The whole fight, we talked about this pretty extensively in one pod, but the fight with her and Anne, the fight with her parents. Yeah, she, she just was given so much to work with this season and she killed all of it. Just, it was amazing. Her character development made sense with what they'd been building for the past two seasons and it was easy to follow. It was easy to root for, but at the same time, it wasn't, perfect by any means I mean she definitely had flaws that came from it she didn't just turn into this badass independent woman and immediately that was it like it was just so easy to root for her there were growing pains with it and she hurt people along the way and the the conflicts that came with it like I said just they made sense to me I very much enjoyed all watching all of Diana's storyline this season and every time Delilah was on screen she just was killing it so I I can't I really can't gush about her performance enough (laughs) this season obviously because this is not at all the first time I'm talking about it but she just really stole the show for me I think I agree I think we'll just continue agreeing with each other but Diana I'm gonna talk about Delilah Delilah Bela Bela I don't know Delilah she like you said, has such range in a way where she can... Okay, some theater theory. 
you can say something in a dialogue but have a different meaning to it which you have to learn and it is something you have to finesse and it takes a while to get it right she mm -hmm. can say something and have three layers underneath it that actually means something else and it is so beautiful to see how she has a very intentional way of acting and it's all so clear and nothing is vague whilst still having all of those layers underneath. It's just so good. Like she can, uh, like you said, we still root for her despite her having these flaws and having her make these mistakes because it just it's just so relatable. Boy problems, rebelling against your parents. And throughout the show, I felt like Diana could easily have her own show because it's yes. also interesting to see a privileged girl in a time like that kind of grow into her own and try to find her independence and fight for that. And like, I remember in season one when... Uh, Diana and Anne were having tea and were getting drunk that Diana said like oh my mom is sending me to finishing school and it was in a very uh, n normal voice like she just this was her future this was her path she didn't she didn't question it because she was you know 13 12 13 years old with her now running away from the parlor to take her exam without having w without having learned anything uh, in advance. So I just love how Diana was our way to look into the world of Anne because she was the most relatable, in my opinion. Yes, it was just, I, I just cannot gush enough about Delilah's performance. And guys, we're both theater kids. Like we both, uh, Ophelia even more so than I am. Um, <laughs> but... Yeah, just the theory behind it and her technique and everything just brought Diana to life. She was so layered this season. And like I said, I've always loved Diana, but it's always been because she's this kind of sweet, you know, nice, good character, which is great. That's good to have. But I think up until this point, she'd always just been Anne's best friend, and that was really one of the only things about her. Season two, they started nuancing it a little bit more, but I think, yeah, this season was, was her season, for sure. Uh, what other characters were you like, wow, they they are killing it? Well, besides Minnie Mae. <laughs> my... No, no, right. She was killing it. I she loved her. Okay, I don't know who this child actor is, but... <laughs> Holy <laughs> shit, dude. Kira, uh, I can't remember her last name. It's Kira something. But the whole scene with her and Diana, uh, when she's hiding in the wardrobe and she's crying, wow. <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever seen, there's very few performances of child actors I've seen that have been better than this one. But in truth, besides Minnie Mae, Ruby was also someone that kind of stuck out to me, but in a much more subtle way, I think, than the previous seasons, which honestly made me a little bit sad. I wish that we'd seen more of the core friendship between her and Anne and Diana that we saw in season two. Yeah, and I missed that. Towards the end of season one. Yeah, I, I, I missed it. It was, but that's really my only complaint about Ruby's character. She also was someone that really came into her own and along with Anne just kind of grew up and matured in a very nice way and I, I think that we had talked about theories before of how they were going to move her kind of away from Gilbert and her crush and coming to terms with Anne and Gilbert or whatever but I'm actually really glad that this step away from Gilbert that they had her take with her hopeless crush wasn't some big dramatic thing it just sometimes happens that way you know like sometimes you just grow up and you outgrow this crush that has been with you for so long. And I, I appreciated that it wasn't some big dramatic, oh my gosh, and like Gilbert kind of thing. It, it worked very well. 
Yeah, I do too. I love the twist of her kind of crushing on Moody and implying like that there is something there. I think it's so cute. They matched so well. I love how she, you know, Ruby, she's smart, but she's not like the the most intelligent person out there. She's just a girl in the world trying to also figure it out. And I loved how this season she accepted her womanhood in that lovely scene in the woods where Anne did this ritual of the girls. Yeah, it felt like her arc was finished. Like, yeah, Ruby started out boy crazy and not really placing herself high. Like, she didn't have high self-esteem. Mm. And now she's like, fuck yeah, I'm a woman. I love <laughs> yes. myself. And I can learn a guy if I want to, because look, look, there's Moody, who's at my tail. Not to say that guys need to be at your feet. That's not what I'm saying. But she just, like, came into her own, like you said, uh, in a very beautiful way. Yeah, exactly. And really, like, uh, just all the characters were so good this season. They were just so... The way that they kind of wrote the maturity was not was very nuanced and subtle it wasn't right in your face it was natural it felt it felt very natural and I think that the fact that they casted these kids so young at the beginning or so close to the ages of their actual characters at the beginning was such a smart move because I think that the actors really truly did grow up with these characters and it just made it even more natural I think when they started writing them more mature so I really appreciated that but really the only two other like super standout characters to me this season were obviously Anne and Gilbert so between the two which character did you most enjoy watching and connecting with this season in particular? Anne because I think Gilbert was, despite being a main character, he was more secondary as opposed to season two, where he was very much the focal point of the season, in my opinion. So I enjoyed Anne more, especially because I did not really like her in season two, because she was still very juvenile in a way that wasn't enjoyable <laughs> to watch yeah but there's a difference between like juvenile and adorable and juvenile and annoying um maybe that was intentional because middle school but whatever yeah just her with her heritage and how solemn she played it all like amy beth sold it in episode yes. two uh, with uh cole cory and then her dealing with love once more, trying to figure it out, also very well done. Yeah, just Amy Beth took me more into the story than Lucas did. Not because Lucas is a bad actor, not at all. He's a great actor. But I think because he was just more secondary, so we were more removed from him than, uh, than And That's probably because, you know, he had more to do with uh, Miss Rose and his apprenticeship. Yeah, I I totally agree. I honestly, again, this is something that I'm going to have to be stopped because I'm probably going to start gushing about Amy Beth's performance this season. But just the way that they wrote Anne, again, it was, she grew up so much. She was less, she was slower to talk and quicker to listen quicker to assess situations there were far less uh scenes or times where her temper got the best of her she wasn't so absent-minded with a lot of things it just it was so subtle and it's so naturally integrated into the story that I, I just really really loved it this season it was way easier to watch her than season two there were far less secondhand embarrassment moments and actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I don't think there was a single flashback this season with no, her past. There was, 
her looking at her younger self, which is kind of a flashback. But was that her younger self, or was it just another kid at the orphanage? It was her. Okay, because that was really, like, the only thing, and even then, she was literally at the site of her childhood trauma. It was, so that's, like, a really heavy thing to, to trigger that to happen, whereas, you know, season one, it happened kind of a lot, because she was just coming out of it. In season two, certain things would still trigger it or certain comments. But the only time where it was at all prevalent in this season was where she was literally at the site of where all of these flashbacks had been happening in the past. And it that was a very good touch because it was something that you didn't really notice until you looked back on it, which is exactly how it should have been. You know, it was natural. It worked. So it's not like it was what you were saying. It's not that Gilbert didn't work for me this season or it wasn't that Lucas was a bad actor or anything like that. Like you said, on the contrary, he's, he's amazing. It's just, I think Amy Beth and the portrayal of Anne was so, uh, just so spot on this season. Couldn't have been any better, in my opinion. Another standout performance was Geraldine James, who plays Marilla. Oh, yes. She has always been great. Like, she's... I love her. (laughs) I love Uh, her so much. The actress and the character. The development Marilla has gone through from season one till now is spectacular. She went from a removed, stoic woman to this loving mother that would do anything for Anne that would go through fire and that is unfazed by her crazy ideas. Like she was unfazed when the whole newspaper thing leaked. She was like, oh, well, I guess. This happens. (laughs) (laughs) Seems about right. Like that, yeah, exactly. Just, Just Geraldine James is such a good actress. I aspire to act like her when I'm older. Her portrayal of Marilla, of... A woman coming into motherhood at a later age in life is just beautiful. And she will be one of the characters I miss most, truly. I agree. And honestly, don't come... Y'all can come from my throat, like, when I say this. But as someone who has consumed all of the other adaptions of Anne with an E, I think Geraldine is hands down my favorite Marilla that has been portrayed so far, so, like, sue me, but she (laughs) absolutely was amazing. She's just a very, very talented actress. She brought a lot of nuance to Marilla, and it all worked. She was, I couldn't have casted anyone better for it, honestly. We briefly mentioned him, but we can, like, go back for a minute, but also Gilbert was really, like, the other person that super, or, like, the last person that, like, really, really, really stood out to me this season. I definitely have a few honorable mentions, but I think Gilbert's character was also very interesting this season. I know that a lot of people weren't super stoked about uh, some of the things that happened surrounding Gilbert this season, but honestly... I was here for it, and I think he did an amazing job with it all. My only complaint, well, it's not even really a complaint. It's just, if you've been listening, you know that one of my big things was I just wanted Gilbert to have a stronger friendship with the kids at the school, and they ended up kind of going the complete opposite direction with it, and kind of using that opposite direction almost as like a plot line. So I was just sorely mistaken and. Even though I get that Gilbert is very mature for his age, very much the kind of person that hangs out with his teacher instead of the students, I I do wish that I'd gotten to see him kind of be more of a a kid, a teenager longer, but I understand that's just not his character. But like I said, they ended up kind of going the complete opposite direction, especially when when he was introduced, like the parallels of just one of the examples that I kind of like jotted down was you know, you have the kids after they took the exams, like drinking moonshine and, and having a blast and just celebrating. While the scene that was being running parallel to it in that moment was Gilbert sitting down talking about marriage with this girl's father while he's drinking like fancy scotch. I think it was very much part of his character this season and it worked, but I would be lying if I said I wasn't just a little bit disappointed. Yeah, but 
I'm glad you pointed this out. I think they had that parallel to showcase, like, what the fuck is he doing? He's 17 years old and he's exactly. doing all of this. Like, it was just so jarring that we all collectively knew he had to be at that party with his friends drinking moonshine because why would you want to marry at 17 you know i'm sorry for the people in america that like marry at 17 i'm sorry <laughs> but um yeah uh, it was intentional but i also enjoyed lucas's performance as well i liked gilbert this season i think he's just a very consistent character that went through most of his development in season two so he wasn't like extraordinary this season he just had to figure out you know love i think it's just like what you said i mean it was just he kind of went through all of his development in season two and it was excellent development i think gilbert was kind of the standout character of season two definitely he was just kind of ahead of the curve i guess So while we had watched Gilbert develop so much in season two, season three was really like the focal point for basically everybody else. So I think that's probably why it felt like they were doing less with Gilbert was because he had already gone through all of that already. Yeah, I think I think that's kind of probably where a lot of it fell flat for some people, which I totally understand. But I just I think there was definitely a reason behind it. What are your honorable mentions? Because I don't have that category, but I like to know yours. Well, Jerry, first of all. Jerry, for sure. Minnie May. <laughs> Minnie May, honestly, Queen, loved her. Had to talk about her like every episode because I'm garbage. Kakwet, obviously, was a big honorable mention for me. Miss Stacy, love her so much. The ideal depiction of a teacher, I think it was very important to see that, especially coming off of like Mr. Phillips as a teacher miss stacy hazel bath mary honestly the characters were just so well written for this season like basically anybody that wasn't someone we just went into detail about was an honorable mention just because everyone was so fleshed out and great this season but those were definitely my top ones like mary bash coquette miss stacy yeah for sure i'm gonna miss mary oh my gosh (laughs) i cried about that for a few days I just missed her so much. And honestly, that is the only thing that I'm, I guess, quote unquote, glad we don't have a season four for is that I don't have to watch a show without Mary in it. It was so sad and so beautiful. And she was just such an amazing character. It hurt a lot. She brought light to the Blythe household. I don't know. Like, ah, I'm... I'm (laughs) I'm going to get sad again. Why did she want to die? I'm still not over it. I think about it weekly, probably. Like, damn, Mary's dead. Yep. Ugh, oh, God. It's rough. <laughs> kind of funny because I think they knew that everyone was, like, amping up for Matthew to die. And everyone was like, okay, so when Matthew dies? And they just, like, pulled a different parental figure out from under us. So, ouch. Thanks a lot for that, Moira. Now that we've discussed the characters, let's go on to oddities. And we named it oddities because about the things that didn't quite make sense or that are unfinished. So, for example, Kukwet's storyline, so or so, we'll discuss it. Um, Right now, actually, uh, Kukwet's storyline, you could say, is unfinished. But if you look at history, if you watch the podcasts, right before this one about the 3x10 discussion you know that if you look into history you can fill in the blanks but still it isn't finished and i do wish we saw that being resolved what about you yeah i i agree and again we did talk about this in the episode right before it but It is very, very sad, but historically, that is kind of what we can infer happened. I wish that we'd seen it carried out. I obviously wish that wasn't the case. But unfortunately, that that was the historical context of everything. And it hurt seeing it with Coquette, obviously, because she was just such a bright, beautiful character. And I do wish, again, that we could have seen the resolution for that. But I think that was maybe 
something again we don't know exactly what was going on behind the scenes we don't know when they sort of realized they weren't going to have a season four but I think that was the plot that Moira was hoping she could get back to if she was gifted another season. And it's really sad that 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 wasn't the case. But yeah, it's very sad. Bash and Miss Stacy. I first want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, it's like what I kept saying, I guess. Just I I wasn't sold on it was pretty much the bottom line. I wasn't like, no, stop. I hate this. Don't do it. I just absolutely was not sold. I was going to be extremely upset if it happened this season, which now it, it just won't. <laughs> but I, I know. <laughs> I was enjoying the dynamic that they had, and I would have very much preferred that they kept it that way, where, you know, they both lost people. They could, their spouses, they could grieve that together. They would have been very interesting as friends. But yeah, I don't, I don't know if that was something they were kind of implying, but I, where they left off, yeah, where they left off, I was not for it. I know you were very much not for it. Yeah, every time I realized like, oh no, they're putting them together in a scene, I was just like, yeesh. I just did not understand the necessity for this to happen in a romantic frame. Like, Mary has died, and you're putting Miss Stacy on his doormat. Like, I don't... Right. I don't care. I don't want it. I just... Yeah. I think, especially, even apart from the Mary thing, I just loved seeing Miss Stacy as this anomaly of the time where she was single, and she was totally okay with that. And I liked seeing that. Same. So... Even just an added layer to, like, the fact that Mary had just died, that was very niche to me. I just, I thought that that's kind of what they have been going for. That's kind of what they wanted to portray. And then they just kind of backed off of that. So, yeah, I was I was just kind of confused by it in general. I'm also sad that we won't get to see Marilla and Rachel be a part of the board, like the committee. Yeah. Because Rachel... Such a stunt. I loved that scene. And now we won't get to see, like, the aftermath of it, which is kind of upsetting. Like, Rachel as a businesswoman. Fuck yeah. Ooh, yes. Give it to me. Like, I would have loved to see that. And uh, what do you think about kind of unresolved Diana Jerry thing? Yeah, that was, like, the first oddity that I really marked down was... That was just very surprising. You know, in all of the trailers and stuff, they'd kind of been marketing it as, like, something that was going to happen. And they gave us no indication that it wasn't. So I think people very much got their hopes up. And obviously, that's how we were going into it, reading it, was we were like, okay, this is just going to be a cute little side ship that's going to happen. It'll be great. And it just took a nosedive. (laughs) Obviously, I think technically, I guess it was resolved, but I would have really have appreciated seeing a different scene where they're not both upset and emotional and angry and figuring stuff out and they can just sit down and be like, hey, so that was a thing (laughs) that was weird and we didn't like that at all. So let's talk about it. But I guess not. (laughs) I don't know if that's something they would have continue to do i think it would have made a lot of sense if they'd had it in this season but yeah what about you i just felt betrayed because i was the clown i was the biggest clown of the fandom saying they were going to elope and then oh, they yeah. break up and i felt shattered Honestly, so that's one thing. <laughs> and it wasn't even like they were just breaking up. It was like Diana had just been using him, and that was so unexpected. Yeah, and I don't know. I just, yeah, it just felt unresolved. And although, like, her just cutting it off and running away is a very teenager thing to do, like, I've seen it happen before. But in terms of the TV show and plotline, I wish they had another scene afterwards talking 
about maybe maybe if they had a season four you know maybe it would be like an on and off kind of relationship like oh diana isn't now above everyone else she's also at queens and maybe there is a possibility they will be together in the future again uh but we don't know that obviously i I just still feel like a clown (laughs) yeah that was rough and kind of weird another kind of oddity that i had written down was just Winnie's character in general, like, I can't tell if it worked or if it didn't, especially with the way that it ended with Gilbert. Um, We talked about it so much, but, you know, she was not supposed to feel like someone that you could root for and really connect to. But the way that they'd been portraying her, I just wasn't expecting that outburst at all, which is something we talked about, you know, in the pod right before this. But yeah, I don't know. I can't tell if she worked or not or if she wasn't even supposed to or if I hated it or I I honestly don't even know yeah I don't really have an opinion I just I I, yeah she was very robotic very removed reserved I called her AI or the nickname Winifridge if you remember oh yes bring it back (laughs) yeah it's an oddity I wonder if it's how she was written or if it's the actress or yeah just something didn't sit right and I can't put my finger on it I'm sorry yeah it's hard to express and again we've said it multiple times I think that's how it was supposed to be but if it wasn't then it was just a poorly written character so okay can I can I confess something always and it's really fanficy. <laughs> of course. I wish we had more drama between Charlie and Gilbert. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, we saw his annoyed expression. Gilbert's annoyed expression when Diana mentioned Charlie when he posted something on the take notice board. But I wanted more. I wanted a glare. I wanted a scoff. I wanted one sentence. One sentence that expressed his jealousy. Jealousy. Because I would have lived, honestly. Same. And it is fanfic-y, but also, like, they kind of were setting up the whole Charlie thing to be a way bigger deal than it ended up being. So that also kind of took me by surprise. But yeah, I was expecting like a big Jealous Gilbert plotline and that was not uh, at all the case. Which is fine because it's not Riverdale. But still, I think my fan heart can't. I I, I need it. I just need it. It's a a disease. No, I totally agree. I'm, I'm fully with you on that one. Well, I think we would be amiss if we didn't obviously discuss Sherbert at least just briefly I think that we probably won't go into very much detail about it because um I feel like this whole podcast season has been primarily focused on Sherbert uh so all of our thoughts are in all of the podcasts if you want to know just go back and listen (laughs) but mainly I loved it although I I do wish and we've talked about this that there had been more time been in this middle ground with Sherbert where we got to see them really develop as friends um yes but alas I think which we talked about it also but I think it honestly that is something that makes me wonder if they didn't kind of have an idea that they probably were not going to get renewed so they felt like they just kind of had to do it all right now um so yeah I think they really did work this season they had some unbelievably good moments Again, if you want to know all of our opinions, you probably know that in every single episode there was at least one giant Sherbert thing, and we discussed it for sure in all of those podcasts, so you can go back and listen. But yeah, they did; they were good this season, but I do wish that we'd had more time in that sort of middle ground. I agree. Um, something felt rushed, and I do think they knew season three might be the end since They had to work to get a season two. They had to work to get a season three. So they were like, all right, the contract with Netflix is crumbling down. I suppose this is the end. 
And if they were going to rush it, they did it well. Like, if, yeah. if they had to rush it, if they had to hurry it up, I'm glad that they did the things that they did. So, in terms of rushing, they couldn't have done any better, in my opinion. But I, I just wish that they didn't have to at all. But, alas. Yeah, I agree. Like, it wasn't bad. I still like that they are now endgame, that they've kissed. It just... In the ideal world, it could have been a little slower. Right, exactly. I agree. So, I want to quickly talk about fandom culture. Obviously, Alexis and I are both in fandoms. We have a freaking podcast about the show. (laughs) So, we're, you know, all in it. It's fine. But... We do like to explain the difference between making a show your number one priority in life. And before you get defensive, I know how much a show or a movie or a game can be a lifeline uh, in hard times. Yeah, we both have experienced that, for sure. We're not talking bad about that at all. But... You do have to remember that whatever you are fixating on is still fiction. So I want to discuss the Shannon Lucas thing. If you don't know, Lucas, who plays Gilbert, is in a real-life relationship with this girl called Shannon. They're Mm -hmm. very much in love. They're very much together. They're even living together. Like, it's a real thing. But because of Lucas's character, Gilbert... She has been attacked since the beginning of Anne with an E because of her relationship with Lucas. Because Mm -hmm. a lot of people can't seem to differentiate between Lucas and Gilbert since Gilbert is madly in love with Anne. What I'm trying to say is Anne with an E is now over. So, you know, that madness will obviously end. But once you start fixating on another show, please differentiate between actor and character because these actors have real lives with real yeah. relationships and we shouldn't be meddling into their personal lives into their private lives we should keep it separate it shouldn't be like this where you can harass someone's girlfriend or boyfriend it's just wrong you wouldn't want that for yourself no. and It just makes the fandom of itself very unenjoyable to be in because you have these two camps, basically. And that's not nice. That's not fun. For the actors, I mean, I can't imagine going through that. Honestly, if you do that, you've done... It's deplorable, honestly. So please, before you do it again... Before you think of doing it again, please take a step back, take a deep breath, and differentiate, prioritize. Is it really that important to tell someone's girlfriend they should break up with their boyfriend because the boyfriend has a character on a show who's in love with another character who are both fictional? It is not important, honestly. So that's just a quick-ish word (laughs) on fandom cults. Right, and honestly... Again, we are not at all talking bad about fandoms in general. We're not at all talking badly about loving a show or even loving actors in a show. Because like we said, you know, being hyper fixated on something can be very much a coping mechanism for people. It's been a coping mechanism for me. It's been one for Ophelia before, which we have touched on in the past. But you absolutely cannot let that bleed into how you treat and view and interact with actors of the show who are real people who also struggle with emotions who struggle with maybe being in the spotlight who have real lives and real relationships and honest if you get offended uh by what ophelia just said because if if you're offended by the implication that you need to be able to separate a show from real life people and harassing them online to the point where Shannon had to delete social media for a little while because it was so bad and because people were saying such horrible, horrible things to her online. If you think that's okay in any sense of the word, then you should be offended by what we're saying because that is not okay. 
And it's not okay to let that start bleeding into people's personal lives and, and uh, affecting them. I remember there was this whole thing, I think between season two and season three, where some people found Lucas's workplace and like leaked where Lucas worked um, outside yeah. of the show, like at a restaurant. And that is not at all okay. That is such an invasion of privacy. They're just people just like you. And honestly, we could go on and on about this, but all of that to say in summary, like we said, we're not at all talking bad about the culture. We're not at all talking bad about fandoms or anything like that because they're so important to us, but you have to be able to separate them from your real life for not just your sake, but also for the sake of the actors, for the people involved in the show. Yeah, please, please take a step back, take a deep breath, prioritize these things. They are important. We understand how they can be important to you, but they shouldn't be important enough to start interfering with other people's lives and well-being so rant over i think the only thing we have left is the q a we only received one question regarding the wrap-up by bon Duel, and she says hi there i'd love to hear a list of plot lines you would like to have resolved which we've done and also comment a bit on what has not worked in and with an e this season but also in general least favorite subplots, underdeveloped characters, etc. So maybe overall what has not worked on end with an E to me personally, only the thief storyline has not worked. Uh, what about you? Yeah, full agree. Really everything else like completely worked for me. Um, but the thieves just really fell flat. That was not great. Oof, remember when Marilla was kind of attracted to one of the oh. guys? Oh, that was so horrible. That was the worst. <laughs> I guess that also goes hand in hand with least favorite subplot and everything. Yeah. Underdeveloped characters? Quite honestly, I can't think of one. Tilly, maybe? Mm, Tilly and Jane, I guess. Yeah, but everyone else, I think those are really the only two I can think of off the top of my head. I would have loved to see more from Moody also, but... I don't think that means he's underdeveloped. I think it just would have been interesting to see more. But from the characters, I think that it really mattered with. Yeah, everyone was excellent. And then another question she had was, I'd love to hear what you think about the berries. I think it's an interesting story because they make all the mistakes while parenting, but they seem willing to improve. And I agree. They help Mary and Bash. And they and eventually they also agreed to let Diana go to Queen. So you know, they, they are willing to improve. Mm-hmm. What do you think? Yeah, I love the berries. I mean, most of the time. But I also think that it was just presented very well in the sense that everything that they did, I think, was what they thought was best for their child. And that very much shone through. It was never unmotivated. You know, the mistakes that they made while parenting. And as we saw with, I think, Matthew and Marilla also, like, it is common to make mistakes with parenting. You're not going to be perfect and things are going to go wrong and you're not going to do the right thing but it was yeah it was just all done very well i really really liked the berries and everything so that was everything we have written down do you have anything else to add on the side or thank you guys so much for listening um we are going to take a quick hiatus before we start doing our rewatch and everything just because of the holidays and kind of recovering from university stress and everything so yeah just There aren't really any words that could express how thankful we are for everything. So I'm just not even going to try. But that's really what I have to say. Me too. I've really enjoyed uh, recording every week. I mean, now we've kind of taken a small break because of life. But recording every week, experiencing it all with you guys and just seeing people respond positively to our bullshit is amazing yeah i just i just really enjoyed this period of my life right now from september till december Mm -hmm. so thank you guys so much we are on tumblr we are call me cordelia podcast that is our share tumblr and what is your personal tumblr uh, alexis (laughs) i'm at sherberts with two s's and i'm at lydia's dash dash styles And that was our season three wrap up. Thank you guys so much for listening. And we'll see you sometime in the future. Bye. See y'all soon. Bye.